Now that we have gone through and explored the subject of advanced external ballistics and examined all of the significant corrections needed to precisely adjust your fire at extreme long ranges, we need to put it all together in a streamlined, logical, field expedient fashion so that we can quickly and efficiently correct for all the different variables that could throw off our shot at extreme long ranges. Now, depending on the size of your target, the distance to that target, and the atmospheric conditions at the time of firing on that target, there are a number of variables you're going to need to correct for if you wish to score a clean first round hit. There are a number of ways that precision shooters use to address all these different variables to make long range shots. So, to get a good perspective on how uh, our different various options are going to work, let's uh, first examine the different ways folks generally use to adjust fire when shooting at long ranges and examine their suitability at the ranges they are most commonly employed. So let us first start off at point blank range and then we'll work our way out. As you probably know already, most modern center fire rifle cartridges offer great close and medium range ballistic performance. So the first range category we're going to look at is at close range, which we're going to uh, call point blank range. And the primary means of adjusting fire at this range is point blank zero. Many rifles can be effectively set at a designated point blank zero in which, uh, depending on the shape of the trajectory and the size of the target, one can simply hold dead on out to a certain distance before any significant corrections need to be applied to hit the target. Uh, commonly, hunters will employ point-blank zero techniques when they uh, sight their rifles in at 200, 250 meters typically. Being aware of the shape of their trajectories and knowing that one can simply hold on the center of the chest of a deer from 0 to 300 meters and still hit the vital zones. This is the most commonly employed method and is generally effective within 200 or 300 meters. At these ranges, hunters are aware that their bullet will strike a little bit high for most of their trajectory before the zero range and will hit a little bit low out to a certain limited distance beyond the point blank zero range. Due to the limited distances this method is effective for, no significant ballistic corrections need to be applied except for target lead and for really strong crosswinds. Now, although good marksmanship is indeed needed to hit targets at these distances, for our purposes, we'll call these uh, close ranges. So when we say close range, that's what we're talking about, where you can just employ point blank zero and still hit your target zone. Beyond a cartridge's point-blank range lies what we will call medium ranges, in which there is enough bullet drop to warrant an elevation correction to be applied in order to hit the designated target, but it's not yet far enough to require significant atmosphere corrections to be applied in order to hit that target. At these ranges, you'll miss the target if you don't correct for a bullet drop and crosswinds. So from 300 to 600 meters, Changes to the bullet's trajectory caused by barometric pressure variations, temperature shifts, and muzzle velocity variation are not yet large enough to cause a miss on the vitals of a full-size target, although you will begin to see significant point-of-impact shifts start to occur due to those factors. For small targets or for cartridges that lack the ballistic efficiency we defined earlier in the series, Medium ranges may be defined at much closer distances than 300 to 600 meters. But generally speaking, out to 600 meters, you can usually get away with hitting a full-size target without worrying too much about the additional corrections to your windage and to your base drop values, which we're going to start referring to as our super elevation values. That's just your base drop values for standard conditions without any additional atmosphere corrections being applied. So there are really a bunch of different ways. There are five ways that are commonly employed to make corrections once you get out to medium ranges and a little bit farther. Uh, the first one we can look at here is what I will refer to as SWAG. It's an acronym. It's basically, uh, at risk of being a little bit crude, what it stands for, Scientific Wild-Assed Guest. 
And this is the most commonly employed method and is usually applied by Holoff or some guys might call Kentucky windage. And this method can vary from ineffective to very effective based on the shooter's experience level and the, his familiarity with the ballistic profile of his load at these distances. So a well-seasoned and experienced rifleman can often make really good hits out to 500 meters or maybe even a little further without any ballistic tables or ballistic drop compensating radicals to help him out. However, if you didn't grow up on a rifle range and have never burned out a couple of rifle barrels, shooting at high-value targets or live game, like if you're hunting, at these ranges uh, using swag would be very irresponsible and is not recommended. Swag is only to be employed when you have to take a shot irregardless of the consequences of a possible miss and you only have a split second to do so. Uh, even if you have a couple of seconds, it's highly recommended to use them to apply some sort of calculated correction value and dramatically increase your likelihood of success. So uh, swag kind of works for plinking, and if you're really experienced, you might be able to do it better than a lot of folks, but it does take a lot of practice if you want to be effective using swag. But it's not recommended for our purposes of precision shooting. The word precision kind of reduces the whole guessing part, right? The second way to adjust for these uh, corrections is what we're going to call calculated hold off. This is basically where the rifleman will use range cards with bullet drop and windage hold off values expressed in units of linear distance such as inches, centimeters, or feet or whatever, or cubits, or I don't know what you're going to use, but they're going to correct for these primary ballistic effects. This is uh, simply calculated hold off by eye is what we're talking about here when we're talking about calculated hold off. This method is uh, most commonly employed You'll see hunters who are utilizing standard configuration sporting optics where precise turret adjustments or reticle hold-off corrections are not a viable option. This method is usually greatly preferred over swag as it is based on ballistic data rather than just instinct, instinct or guessing. However, it does become more and more limited as you start to reach farther and farther out there. Most people don't really have a problem discerning hold-off values of up to 40 inches or so without the aid of a reticle, uh, but much more than that. And folks really start to have a, a hard time knowing like what 57 inches over the center of a deer's chest would look like through the scope. It just becomes hard uh, for the eye to make that uh, spatial perception. So this uh, method calculated hold off, just kind of holding over, but, but using a number in your head, this limits the use of hold offs without the assistance of scaled reticles to around 500 meters or less. For shots on full-size targets, just outside the point-blank range of a cartridge, where there is uh, very little time to adjust for anything, this can work fine, but it is not near as effective as the next method we're going to go over, especially when smaller targets present themselves. Ballistic drop compensation is the correction method most commonly employed by law enforcement or the designated marksmen uh, that you'll see in the military in which bullet drop and windage are adjusted for using either hold off with the use of a scaled reticle uh, in some cases or by indexing the turrets on the optic directly. This method typically employs the use of either drop charts, uh, BDC reticles or turrets, or uh, auto-ranging trajectory cams like you'll see on some of the Leatherwood scopes to compensate for super elevation. This can be an effective and relatively quick technique when engaging full-size targets out to 500 or even 600 meters away and is much more precise than hold-off by eye, like we were talking about with the calculated hold-off. Scopes with BDC reticles can be particularly quick at medium ranges. And if you look at the U.S. Army's M3A optic, it's equipped with a BDC marked elevation turret, which does have the capacity to be adjusted in other angular units as well. And it also has a mill dot reticle, which can be used to correct for bullet drop and wind. Many sporting scopes offer BDC or ballistic drop compensation reticles that are matched to a particular cartridge uh, with a certain load with special hash marks that are set to particular ranges 
which compensate for your super elevation adjustments. However, the effectiveness of these methods are kind of limited to medium ranges. And as we discussed earlier in the series, beyond 500 or 600 meters, we begin to see significant point of impact shifts due to changing atmospheric conditions and muzzle velocity variation issues. So failing to correct for barometric pressure, uh, ambient air temperature, and muzzle velocity variation due to ammunition temperature, uh, if you fail to correct for that stuff much beyond 600 meters, it's going to result in a significant miss. So a more precise system will be required to effectively engage targets beyond 600 meters. But, uh, you know, out to 600, ballistic drop compensation may be a viable option in uh, many cases. Uh, medium ranges, you do still have the option if you want to get into more detail, particularly if you're shooting at smaller targets, you can do a detailed uh, ballistics table. And uh, that's going to be a little bit superior to the ballistic drop compensation method. This method corrects for all the major atmospheric variations from uh, the so-called standard conditions your ballistic tables were developed for. The most effective way this is done in the field is to have a hasty ballistic table prepared that has the drop data arranged in such a way that corrects for barometric pressure, air temperature, and muzzle velocity variation due to ammunition temperature in a semi-logical fashion. And once the firing solution is found on the ballistics table, it is simply indexed onto the optic or precisely held off for using a properly scaled reticle. Uh, we learned how to construct our hasty ballistic tables previously in the series, so if you missed that, please go back and check those out. They are really the easiest and the best way to go for medium and even uh, a lot of the long-range firing solutions as they correct for all the major variations that throw off your point of impact the most. So if you want to score first round hits on small targets in a hurry, having a set of logically set up ballistic tables is a must and will be a crucial part of your weapon system. So this is the, the method I primarily recommend for shooting uh, out to 600 meters you can use ballistic drop compensation, but the bl detailed ballistics tables will get you a lot more close to this exactly where your point of aim is than will just the standard ballistic drop compensation that's not uh, adjusting for any of those atmospheric conditions. And the last way to go that we're going to mention here is handheld ballistic computation devices. Now, these can be very, very precise and pretty quick to use. And uh, they work very well if they're set up and used properly. However, their effectiveness will be limited by several things, which we're going to get into in a minute. Another thing to mention here, at medium ranges, which we designated from 300 to 600 meters approximately, depending on your cartridge, is that uh, spin drift and Coriolis will exist at these ranges, but they're going to have very little effects on your point of impact and are not, not going to be a crucial part of your firing solutions yet. So that's, uh, that's kind of one of the characteristics of this range. All right, uh, when we're talking about long range, what we're talking about is ranges usually beyond 600 meters in which uh, failure to correct precisely for muzzle velocity variation and the atmospheric effects that we we're talking about earlier are going to have detrimental effects on your ability to make square first round hits. So you can't skimp any of the atmospheric stuff once we get into long range. Also, spin drift and Coriolis effect starts to become as significant as you approach 1,000 meters. So at long ranges where atmospheric variations can't be ignored and where spin drift and Coriolis start to become evident, we will not be able to get away with effectively employing simple ballistic drop compensation techniques alone. There are three ways we're going to recommend to determine firing solutions for long ranges. The first one is what we've just been talking about are the detailed ballistic tables. Now these are those hasty ballistics tables we've been showing you thus far in the series and they can be very very precise if they're set up and employed properly in the field. These particularly work great when a target presents itself in an area you may not have expected and a shot needs to be made very quickly. These can also be every bit as precise as using the full calc forms that we're going to show you here in a minute. And they can even be more quick to use than a ballistic computer in the field. So maximizing the effectiveness 
of the information provided in these tables may take a little bit of practice, but once mastered, you should be able to push extreme ranges under normal circumstances just using these detailed ballistics tables. And it doesn't require a whole lot of math in the field to use them, which is kind of nice. These are definitely the easiest way to go and what I would generally recommend people to use unless a more dynamic firing solution is warranted. Now, sometimes when your atmospheric conditions change and in asymmetrical fashion, I mean, let's say your ambient air temperature is 20 degrees, but your ammo temperature has been warmed to 80 degrees, or let's say you're shooting through multiple air density zones in an extreme high angle shot at very long range, where you have different things mixed together, you may need to separate those factors into individual components so that you can properly weigh them out and calculate a custom firing solution with much greater precision than is possible in the hasty tables alone. So if you're trying to push the envelope and you're requiring greater precision at long ranges, these may be an effective tool to get you on target. Uh, calc forms are simply cheat sheets that are going to help you walk through how to construct a detailed firing solution using specially constructed tables that communicate to us the ballistic effects of each deflective component independently. And we're going to show you how to best set these up and use them in detail over the next few videos. So stay tuned for those for sure. This is the good part of the series right here. And the last one we're going to talk about here are handheld ballistic computers. Now, I'm not going to lie. These things can be very, very precise if you know what you're doing and you know how to properly supplement and edit the solutions they spit out at you. However, their use can be somewhat limited if you don't really know what's going on. Uh, we're going to do a detailed video later on on how to most effectively use handheld ballistic computers. But for now, I'll just give you the quick rundown. There are really good points to using these things, and there are some limiting factors as well. So let's start off with the good points. Well, these things are very, very precise. They're going to give you very accurate firing solutions as long as all your inputs are, in fact, correct. Uh, that's the challenge. Using a handheld device that is either linked to or is integrated with a portable weather station greatly improves their effectiveness as the solutions are updated in real time as the atmospheric conditions change. So if you have a, a ballistic uh, computer, a handheld ballistic computer, and you have to input your atmospheric variables, and you either skip through that quickly, you forget to enter something, or you put in you know, garbage in, garbage out. If you put in the wrong inputs, you're going to get the wrong outputs, obviously. So it's very important to uh, use these things correctly if you do want to use them. And the other really good point to these is they're pretty quick and relatively easy to use. Uh, they are easier to use than a, uh, doing a calc form, probably, in a lot of ways, especially in a tech-savvy world nowadays with everyone kind of on their phones anyways, I guess. Um, there are some limiting points, however, that I can't neglect to tell you guys. And uh, the first main one is... The use of sensitive electronic computer devices may be fine for target shooting applications where battery resupply is not an issue for long periods of time or where battery charges are available when you go home and sit on the couch. But on a hunt, or especially in tactical applications, the reliance on sensitive electronics under harsh field conditions, particularly wet conditions or extreme cold weather, are going to undoubtedly produce major issues sooner or later. Now, I, I've been using these devices under a diversity of conditions, and they do, in fact, go out on you. Uh, if you're going to be using it a lot, it will take, take a dump on you from time to time. And it usually happens when you need it the most. So most of these devices, um, another thing to consider is that most of these devices require a reboot and a compass calibration uh, when you put in new batteries. And that can be unacceptable if this happens when a target presents itself in the real world. So for hunting or tactical apps, I would not plan on using one of these as your primary means 
of deriving your firing solutions. You can use it for backup or you can use it to reconfirm things, but uh, I would not use this as the foundational way of doing it, okay? Uh, the second big thing is these computers are not yet designed to account for all the various parameters that are going to change your point of impact. Uh, they are getting better and they're always developing new stuff, but you will still have to know how to adjust for changing conditions in your rifle bore, muzzle velocity variation, and numerous other factors that we haven't even listed yet. So there are more details that go into this. And another major limitation to using ballistic handheld devices is that they encourage arrested development of the long range shooting skill set. You got to remember that you are supposed to be the primary component of your weapon system. So a sensitive electronic device that can fail you when you need it the most and has caused you to procrastinate learning the science will undoubtedly be the weakest link in your entire setup. So if a guy can't work through a firing solution with the aid of ballistics tables, understanding the concepts and ballistic relationships of the various components, you will not have really any idea what to do when your computer spits out a wrong number at you. And that does happen. Um, sometimes they give you uh, something that was a little crooked and you don't know what to do. So let's say you take a shot and it, it hits high. And that's exactly where your ballistic computer told you to, to hold. And you double checked everything that you could find. Um, you're not going to really have any idea what's going on. And you may start stabbing into the dark trying to adjust the parameters to match your observed results. And uh, that can cause a lot of problems. You might be barking up the wrong tree to, trying to problem solve. So there's no substitute for actually learning the science because as the primary component of the weapon system, you better be able to pro uh, troubleshoot uh, problems that, that will arise in the field, even with ballistic computers. Now, I've seen this many times with very well-accomplished long-range shooters is uh, reliance on these ballistic computers, and sometimes the data doesn't match reality. And that's because there is more detail to reality than meets the eye sometimes. And if you don't have a comprehensive understanding of all these different uh, things going on, you're going to be left in the dust. So that's another major limitation. And there's one more thing that a guy should mention, and I'm sure I don't have to illustrate the folly of a guy planning to use an app on his phone for his long-range computer when we reach some kind of bad scenario that a lot of guys... Are, uh, you know, that's why a lot of guys get into this is because they're anticipating a Red Dawn type deal or something. Now, having an app on your phone for Red Dawn, that's going to be pretty funny if that ever would happen, at least for me. Now, the last thing on earth you are going to want to have in your pocket, if God forbid Red Dawn ever actually occurred, will be your iPhone, right? So why would a guy want to spend valuable training hours on something that will not be an option in real life. Now, I'm not knocking uh, iPhone apps. Uh, they can be very handy for target shooting. So for pure sports shooting applications and target shooting, uh, this is not really a bad idea. It's pretty handy. It's uh, And it works very well. The, the, the math is very precise on these things. But I still get a little grouchy when I hear how the kids nowadays can't add or subtract in the schools because they are letting their iPads do it all for them. It's the same general idea there. So there's no substitute for actually knowing it in your head rather than counting on your phone to be there uh, at all times. You know, it's, The phone is not going to be your mommy out there in the field. So having to go through the process of constructing these ballistics tables and learning how to work with these different parameters will be the most valuable hours that you're going to spend in this discipline. If you think about a helicopter pilot, a helicopter pilot better understand why the helicopter goes up when he pulls on the collective lever if he doesn't want to die in the first five minutes. And a long-range rifle operator better understand why the bullet hits high or why it hits low as the conditions change if he doesn't want to die in the first one minute. So having this stuff on paper and walking through the process 
is really the best way to travel and is why the experts still rely on their brains as their primary ballistic computers rather than a fragile piece of technology that uh, could possibly glitch at any given moment. Now, I do love my Kestrel horse. I think that that was a great purchase. I do use it, but I would not get one until you really know what's going on because getting one while well, a guy is still uh, learning some of this stuff will not really help anyone accomplish anything except maybe learning how to rely on a computer. So I wouldn't train in learning to rely on a computer is my main point with ballistic computers. The last range class we're going to talk about is extreme long range. These are the ranges which you are approaching the limits of what your cartridge will give you. We define extreme long ranges as those distances in which spin and Coriolis have a significant effect on point of impact and where failure to precisely correct for any of the above mentioned variables will result in failure to hit the target. For most cartridges, you're going to start to see a significant point of impact shift due to spin drift at around 900 meters or so. And you're going to typically begin to see significant Coriolis effect uh, around maybe 1,400, 1,500 meters if you can reach that far uh, supersonically. Now, the outer limits of these extreme long ranges in which we can effectively deliver fire are defined by the transonic region, which we talked about earlier in the series. So once the bullet goes transonic, we lose that dynamic stability and thus can't have any reasonable expectation of consistent accuracy much beyond that point. Now, most rifles don't make it much beyond 1,000 meters before they start to go transonic, but some of your more efficient long-range projectile designs launched at adequate velocities can push 1,500 meters or more. So at these distances, it is strongly recommended to do a custom firing solution using a calc form, or at the very least, to use your detailed ballistic tables to get on target. Ballistic computers can also be very helpful at extreme long ranges if you employ them properly, And I, but again, I would warn you not to rely on them too much. So if you're shooting your uh, 50 cal with AMAX bullets out to 2,000 meters or whatever, um, at extreme long ranges, Forgetting about even Coriolis effect alone can result in a miss in the magnitude on the order of feet rather than inches. So at these distances, you can't get away with ballistic drop compensation alone like a lot of guys um, got used to, or you can't uh, apply swag or even calculated holdover. You're not going to be able to hold over 108 feet over the target. You're not going to be able to discern that distance just by looking uh, through a duplex crosshairs. Okay, so let's take a quick sneak preview at the calc forms, and then we'll hit it full bore on the next few videos. In order to deliver the most precise fire possible at long ranges, and especially extreme long ranges, you're going to have to learn how to make the following determinations. Uh, to set up your calculation forms, you're going to need the, not only the calc forms, but you're going to need a, a primary functions table and a secondary functions table. And this is detailed ballistic information that you're going to use in your calculation form to make up your firing solution. And the first thing you're going to have to decide is you're going to have to designate standard conditions for your area of operations. Uh, for me, that might be, you know, uh, 27 inches of mercury at 2,000 foot altitude uh, 60 degrees Fahrenheit or something. It depends on where you're at, but you're going to designate standards for your AO. After you have that uh, picked out, you're going to go ahead and build up your primary functions and secondary functions tables. And I'll show you how to do that in detail in the next few videos. When you're using these things in the field, what you're going to do is you're going to have your uh, various information out there and you're going to have to look at your calc form. And the first thing it's going to want to know is your range to the target. You're going to have to determine your true range, and you're going to have to determine your actual horizontal range, okay? And we'll explain why in the next coming videos. Uh, then using your true range for some of the corrections and your actual horizontal range for some of the other corrections, you're going to have to determine your elevation settings and the traverse settings on your optic. You're going to have to have a certain amount of holdover and a certain amount of uh, hold off, right? 
So you're going to have various components working. Uh, for the elevation uh, portion of the calculation, you're going to have to determine the super elevation setting to compensate for bullet drop at your designated standard conditions. Then you're going to have to correct for non-standard barometric pressure variations. You're going to have to correct for muzzle velocity variation due to ammo temperature and your current bore conditions like we talked about earlier. You're going to have to correct for ambient air temperature variation. You're going to have to correct for atmospheric humidity if you're far enough. Uh, and then you're going to have to correct for a vertical Coriolis effect based on your direction of fire at your latitude. Again, if we're far enough to warrant that correction. And we'll show you how to determine all that soon. Then you're going to have to figure out your traverse settings. That's your left and right, okay? And uh, you're going to have to ter determine your hold-off values and index scope values for both wind speed and direction. And we're going to show you, as we get into more detail in the series, how we make those determinations for the wind at uh, different locations, including your final firing position, your max ordnance, and at your target. So you get a good uh, overall uh, calculation of what the wind is doing all the way from you to your target, not just at your current position. Then you're going to have to figure out your spin drift and your horizontal Coriolis for your latitude and uh, target lead if you have a moving target. Now, you will not only have to know how to calculate the corrections uh, and the values for each one of these different factors, but you're going to have to know how to best organize and apply these corrections in the field so that you don't miss a detail someplace or get one of these corrective relationships switched around when you're all excited. Now, the point of these calc forms is to help you uh, streamline this procedure because there's a lot going on. That's a lot of things to correct for. And you have to remember that when you're out in the real world and have to make a shot in haste on a high value target that you've been in that you may have invested hours or days or even weeks tracking down and stocking, uh, that you're gonna be incredibly hindered by the stress of the situation and your cognitive skills are only going to be operating at a fraction of their potential when your body and your mind is experiencing that adrenaline dump when you do see your target. So I'm not going to lie, trying to keep track of all this different stuff can be confounding. So putting together a sound firing solution will be paramount to your success at long range. And these calc forms are going to get you there. You can have all the best gear in the world, the best optics, the perfect scope, the, the exact right ammunition, and the most precise ballistic tables known to man. But if you can't plug it all together properly and uh, get it squared away, you're going to blow the shot, guaranteed, especially at extreme long range. So in this next video, I will begin to walk you through an introduction of the process of calculating a firing solution using one of our calc forms. I'll just go dive right in uh, to the deep end of the pool. We'll just run through it and you can see what it's going. And then we're going to back up and revisit the whole deal in greater detail um, so that you can reap the full benefits of this setup.